you probably get annoyed when people like try to speak in your accent, but I don't know how else to say it because it was so funny to me. He's like, he's like, Royce, I love Australian equities. Welcome to the Savvy Dentist Podcast with Dr. Jesse Green, the show where great dentistry meets great business. Listen in each week as we bring you an inspiring person who will share their story, ideas, and business techniques to help you create a practice and a life you love. And now introducing your host, Dr. Jesse Green. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Savvy Dentist Podcast, the show where great dentistry meets great business. In today's episode, we're having a conversation about money. Now, more specifically, we're talking about how to create wealth for you and your family. As dentists, many of us are in a great position to earn well and earn a good living, but really there is an art and as well as a science behind taking that surplus cash flow and turning it into net worth and net wealth. In today's episode, we're having a conversation with Reese Harper, who is the CEO of DentistAdvisors.com and host of the Dentist Money Show, available on iTunes. We cover an extraordinary amount of ground in this particular conversation, but in particular, we talk about you know, the common mistakes that you know, dentists in particular make when it comes to planning for their future. Uh, we talk about you know how to invest well, where to put your money, in what proportions. We talk about some of the common mistakes and myths around index funds. We we have a conversation about where opportunities lie as well. It's a lot of information that we cover in this particular episode. And there are some details that we go into which are quite specific. So I'm going to really encourage you to take notes, have a pen and paper handy. And I trust that you enjoy this episode that's laden with information from Reese as he shares his knowledge and expertise in the field of financial planning and wealth creation. So without any further ado, here's Reese Harper. Reese Harper, welcome to the Savvy Dentist Podcast. Thanks so much for coming on the show and taking some time out of your day to hang with us. Yeah, Jesse, appreciate you having me on, man. It's a pleasure. Been looking forward to this for a while. Yeah, me too. It's going to be a lot of fun. And we're talking about a couple of my favorite subjects today, which is all about you know wealth creation and, and money and, and trying to get ahead generally. Before we... That's great. I know. It's kind of what we all... <laughs> we're all on, on the planet. That's what it's all about, a, yeah. Life, man. Yeah, that's, what, that's what we do. Before we get into the nuts and bolts of actually how to do that, Reese, I wanted to just get a bit of an understanding for the audience, a bit about your background, because I know you're very prominent in the dental space in the United States. How did that come about? Well, I, I think it came about with, from when I started my business in 2007. It took me a few, you know, when I opened the doors, people weren't like banging down the door to come and meet me, strangely enough, Jesse. You'd think so, because... I'm pretty striking. Yeah, you're a good looking guy. I've seen the photos. (laughs) But people weren't banging down the door. And at the time in the United States, we were going through a pretty major financial crisis. Bear Stearns, uh, Lehman Brothers, Wachovia, Washington Mutual, all these big public companies were kind of going under. And it wasn't a great time to come out and tell people how to invest their money in public markets. (laughs) And so... So I realized really quickly, it was a year or two into my business. And uh, like any entrepreneur who goes through a difficult period, I had to take a really hard look and say, I can't get spread thin. I need to really focus. And I had a chance to look at my clientele and figure out the people I could help the most of anyone and really focus and build a marketing strategy around those people and and I had a few dentists that I had worked with, and one of them was a close friend of mine. And I guess I had heard him complain so much about his current financial advisor. One of this this person wasn't the client at the time; it was my neighbor. And he told me how hard is you know he he just was confused about where all of his money was at, and wasn't really sure what was going on, and that his financial advisor just kept trying to sell him things, and he felt like he he wasn't getting good advice and. It started me just wondering if, you know, he had such little financial background and he was making a good living, but he just wasn't really getting ahead. And he'd been in practice for quite a while and kind of just made me uh, rethink who I was going to focus around. So I started just focusing on Dennis and I rebranded my my business to DentistAdvisors.com. Had to buy the domain name from someone for a pretty penny. Didn't want to sell it to me for cheap and it wasn't available. I thought that was a good domain. Yeah. 
And so I, I ended up uh, building a process around dentists specifically, um, researching a lot about what their pain points were, what the things that really mattered were to them. And I, I started writing content for some of the magazines in the United States. And as my research continued, I kept finding ways to put together language and illustrations and images and ideas that I felt like resonated with my clients. And I guess the rest is history. Now things have just really grown and it's not me anymore. Um, We're a pretty good sized company and we help dentists in every state in the U.S. and some outside. And so just depends on the day. You know, I, I look back and feel really grateful to be, you know, able to know a lot about one type of person because I think I can make a big difference in the dental in the dental space and I'm glad I picked dentistry because I think that a lot of the people in the profession just tend to have really they're interesting people they have good temperaments they love their craft they're artists I and I I really like how much attention to detail that they pay you know and so I guess that's how it kind of happened in a nutshell. Okay. Wow, that's really cool. And you picked up on something very quickly then. I just want to come back to it because I think it's really critical. You you made a comment that dentists typically make good livings, which you know I believe is really true. But there was some people you were speaking to that were still confused about how to turn that you know, good living into you know wealth creation and setting themselves up for a sound financial future. Given the vast number of dentists you speak to and understanding that while there'll be some differences between the United States and Australia, perhaps in terms of tax law and other things, the principles remain the same around wealth creation. Where do you see the common mistakes that dentists are coming unstuck you know, in terms of all this you know, financial planning or, or not being able to translate their good living, their good income into creating something sustainable for you know, future retirement or wealth creation? I think that a lot of dentists, first, first of all, they, they, they tend to compartmentalize their, their money into decisions that are very product specific in the UK or in Australia or in Europe, there are tax advantaged type of accounts that you can put money into. And then there's accounts that you can just save money into that aren't tax advantaged, right? In Australia, I forget the name of the primary tax advantage type of account that you guys have. You have a bunch. You'll have to like refresh my vocab on some of those. But a lot of times people will say, I'm a real estate investor. I like real estate or I invest in my practice because that's where I get the best return or I don't believe in uh, the equity market, you know, or I love uh, Australian equities. That's where I put my money. I, I have a friend who actually told me that. And I, I, I don't, you probably get annoyed when people like try to speak in your accent, but I don't know how else to say it. Cause it was so funny to me. He's like, he's like, Royce, I love Australian equities. And he was just like, I have a, I have a diversified, port, or I have a diversified portfolio of Australian equities. And I was like a diversified portfolio of Australian equities. And I'm like, that's like 2% of the world's market. Exactly. You know? Like, and he's got like 80% of his stock in that because that's his home country bias or that that's where he lives. It's what he understands, what he felt most comfortable with. And has a pretty good 10 year return or 15 year return. And, and so a lot of these dentists, they compartmentalize what they do and, and they, they don't think of their whole net worth or their whole financial picture in in the context of being diversified they think about accounts being diversified but they don't think about how their whole net worth should be like how much should you have in real estate how much should you have in tax advantaged accounts how much should you have in public markets how much should you have in cash how much should be in your practice equity you know how much debt should you carry in the practice um, versus having it paid off all the way so there's kind of the financial planning tends to be a focus on products, a, pro- a focus on mutual funds or stocks or bonds or insurance. But it usually doesn't get to this broader view of what should my net worth look like when I'm at the point of making work optional? You know, and, and I think it's important to start there and and make sure that when you hit that point, you don't have so much of your wealth tied up in one group that it causes disadvantages to you throughout your career and at uh, the point where you're trying to slow down. So that's a big factor. I've had a few other thoughts, but I'll maybe let you respond to that one and ask me any follow-up questions you might have on that. 
Well, I'm dying to hear more of the Australian accent in a moment, but uh, firstly... <laughs> that really wasn't that good. I think I struggle between British and Australian. I think they're, I, I don't do them very well. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's pretty passable. All you need to do is throw a few g'days and a few mates in there and you'll, be, you, you'll be right amongst Yeah, okay, exactly. okay, that's it. <laughs> but come, <laughs> coming back to your point, though, is yeah, I guess you're quite right. Yeah, we often think about products versus the, the, the sum of our, our assets, our net worth. And you know, certainly you know, my experience with financial planners has particularly been feeling like they're trying to push an insurance product versus thinking about my overall financial position. Exactly. That's obviously something that seems to translate the world over. One of the things that you know, I'm in practice management and certainly in the work that I do, Reese, is I have this saying, and it's not my saying, and I can't remember who I've ripped it off from, but excellence is doing ordinary things extraordinarily well you know basically mastering some fundamentals some key things to get right and and my experience has been that when it comes to practice management and i dare say to wealth creation as well that there's a lot of you know fancy strategies that get done at the expense of you know firstly locking down those fundamentals is that something that is you know just my experience or is that something that you would see as well in in your clientele yeah, I, I really I really believe that a lot, Jesse. It's really insightful. And I, I when we first started, I hired my first financial advisor. Um, he's my co-host on the podcast still. If you ever listen to the show, his name is Sir Ryan Isaac. He's Sir been Ryan. knighted by me as a sir. So <laughs> you can be a duke then. <laughs> you can be a duke. Okay, yeah, I can be a duke. So he he came into my office probably the first year after we started, and and he just. He, every time we got a new client, he would go do an initial intake and bring me a mountains of paperwork and just say, you know, they have these five problems. What should I do? And what would you do? And I had to just digest all of these pieces of paper, right? You have their investment account statements, their tax returns, their insurance policies, their bank statements, the way they spend and, uh, and a lot of behavioral things that aren't evident on paper. And, and it was really time consuming to find out if they were doing fundamentals, like you said, if they, if they were doing these fundamental things, like how much do they spend every month and how much do they save? Like on a, not just at a general high level, but like on a percentage basis, if someone is making 300,000 US dollars a year, what percentage of that is going towards debt reduction? What percentage is going to savings? What percentage are they spending? And what percentage is going to taxes? Because it can only go to four places. And rather than talking about it at a high level, I wanted to be able to like quantify. If someone says, yeah, we save money, then I can either take them at face value or I can quantify that and turn it into a calculation and say, you do save money, but you save 7.1% of your gross income. And relative to other 42-year-old dentists, that's 6% below the mean or the average. So you're saving half as much as your peer group. And then that changes the dialogue now. Now savings is being done extraordinarily well if we can quantify how much it is that we are saving and set a goal for the specific percentage that we're going to save. And by following through on that goal and measuring it every year and comparing it to a benchmark of our peers, we can make sure that when we say we're saving money, we're saving the right amount. Not too much, not too little, but just the right amount because too much would mean that we probably are sacrificing vacation and time and balance and family life. And too little is going to mean that we're probably not, uh, we're probably living too extravagant of a lifestyle and we're probably not prioritizing our future quite enough. But the right amount would be at least somewhere in the range of what other people are doing with similar resources and maybe a little bit better than, than the average person, but probably not twice as good as the average person because that means that you're probably not valuing some of the things that would come from just living a, an average great life. And so I find that most people, when it comes to spending or taxes or investing or debt reduction, they do a lot of things that aren't done really well. They just take a stab at a lot of different things and they don't, they don't really turn their financial planning into calculations and execute it in a real precise way. Kind of like, I don't know if uh, how it works in Australia, but I think in the United States it's measured. They, they have a, a, a periodontal tool that measures the number of millimeters that a gum, that gum tissue has in recession, right? Com around the base of the tooth. Yeah. And if, if they didn't use that measuring tool to determine how many millimeters of recession there were, you couldn't really compare 
periodontal disease person to person. You, you would just be subjectively kind of saying this person has a recession or this person has gum tissue recession. If you don't measure it and quantify it, then there's no way to really determine if it needs to be actionable or not. And I feel like that's the big problem with financial planning is yes, everyone needs investing. Everyone needs savings. Everyone needs spending. Everyone needs to pay down their debt, but there's actually a precise amount that would justify action and, and a precise amount that would not. And sometimes the best thing you need to do, Warren Buffett said, sometimes the best, or he said, a lot of times I wish people would just uh, sit still and do nothing rather than take action. And that's that Hippocratic oath, right? First do no harm. And most financial advisors assume that their role is to come in and make big changes. And sometimes the best thing you can do is to tell people to just keep doing exactly what you're doing and don't change. And that's a real big value. So anyway. I, I think that's really fantastic. And there's a, a few questions that have just popped into my head that I'd love to explore a bit further with you. But firstly, coming back to Warren Buffett, I was really fortunate to be on a plane a little while ago and I was watching this documentary called Becoming Warren Buffett. And you know, there's lots of Buffettisms, I suppose, that get thrown around. And I guess one of my favorite ones is, you know, the two rules to, to investing. Yeah, rule number one is never lose your capital. And rule number two is never forget rule number one. <laughs> yeah. And it's interesting, yeah. though, because one of the things that, you know, coming back to those fundamentals is when you don't get those fundamentals wrong and an error is made, you know, the time it takes to recover from a loss is actually far longer than people think because you're relying on that compounding effect to make up lost ground. Yeah, so true. But equally, coming back to the point you made earlier about, you know, the four key areas, you know, debt reduction, savings and the like, I, I know that the percentages are going to vary, you know, from person to person depending on their age and stage of life and all those sorts of things. But broadly, what would be, for the listeners here, what would be some things to think about as they're kind of weighing up those four buckets? What sort of factors come to mind when you're thinking, okay, how what percentage goes into this bucket or that bucket? Well, I would say that for starters, no matter where you're at in life, a good rule of thumb would be to have them be equal, right? If, if, if you could structure your life in a way where your taxes were roughly a fourth of your earnings, which is possible in most countries, in most developed countries today. And if a fourth of your money was going towards mortgages and practice debt and acquisition debt, student loans, and if a fourth was going to spending and lifestyle, all the discretionary fund vacations and food and entertainment and living, and, and then if a fourth was going to long-term savings, that would be a good starting point. That won't be as possible for people right at the beginning of their career because usually their debt will be higher than a, than a fourth but and and usually people at the latter end of their career uh, the the debt becomes lower and the taxes are slightly higher right but as a general rule i don't find that people are even close to those parameters in most cases you know they're usually very disproportionately high on spending percentage or debt percentage or tax and their savings is disproportionately low. When I say savings, I'm not talking about putting money towards retirement. I'm talking about just the money that's left over at the end of every year. What's left over could be money that just piled up in your practice checking account, or it could be extra money that you threw at debt that you weren't required to throw at debt, but you just did. That would be a savings factor for me. So even though you're putting it, the debt, the debt percentage that I'm talking about is the mandatory minimum payments that are required. And so that'd be a good range. You know, I, I created this periodic table of financial elements that a lot of people use to track their finances. And it's basically 12 indicators that tell people, you know, how healthy they are. And four of those are those things we just mentioned, the savings, the spending, the debt and the taxes. The, the periodic table answers four main questions about people's finances. And one of them is, is my money going to the right places? And that's what those four elements that we look at and track and benchmark are. And so by age, I mean, I can really specifically quantify what I think people's savings rates should be based on their age. And it's definitely less than 25% for people right out of the gate. And it's definitely more than 25% for people at the latter part of their career, but it probably never exceeds 40%. And it probably should never be less than 10 and so that's kind of the range. And just as time passes, it should steadily increase. As people earn more money, they shouldn't save a lower percentage. They should save a higher percentage because their lifestyle is kind of a fixed cost. 
right? It, it stays, the, it should stay similar in theory, in theory, it shouldn't grow as quickly as income grows, but it usually doesn't. I was just going to say, my experience as well is, and I'm sure, again, you, you're vastly more qualified to answer this than me, but my observation is that as income grows, oftentimes lifestyle does as well. And, and you know, that, that whole allocation of resources can get a little bit out of skew. And, you know, I'm sure that's something you see as well. That's totally true. Yeah. So one of the things that you're reading lots of financial books, uh, as you know, I'm sure you do it, I do, and I'm, I know a lot of the listeners on the podcast are, are fairly well versed with some investment fundamentals and you know, personal finance fundamentals. But still, the habit of getting into you know allocating the money to those four buckets and and wherever else it needs to go. Oftentimes, if you're relying on memory to do it, yeah, do you, do you have a process where you'd automate that? Where so you, for the next twelve months, you know, until our next review or whatever you know, time frame you set, you go, okay, I'm going to make sure that this is automated, so I don't have to think about it anymore. Yeah, I, I think generally speaking, we try to just use the practice checking account as the place where we determine auto drafts can come from. So once someone gets to two to three months worth of overhead in their practice checking account, then we want to just do at least a quarterly auto draft. But sometimes for most people, we'll do a monthly auto draft. And then from there, we just take a lump sum of money out that we know is equal to approximately 20 to 25% of their gross income. And then we spread that among the accounts that would make sense. And we find that if people don't do that, it's just too difficult to get on top of it. And they'll, they'll tend to increase their overhead in the practice because they'll have excess cash or they'll tend to increase their lifestyle quickly. Keep in mind, as you make more money, we're not saying you can't spend 25% of that additional income on lifestyle. Your, your lifestyle can keep going up, but you just can't have it occupy 75% of your income. Right. And, and so I think that's a key, you know, there's a, a really popular book globally by David Bach called the automatic millionaire. And that whole premise of that book is that auto drafting savings is probably the only way that's predictably going to create wealth for people. And I agree with that. So we have really simplified, well, our office actually sets up the ACHs. We have in-house a lot of accounting software and we can link directly to banks and push and pull money back and forth. And if a client needs, you know, 10 grand for an expense, we can push that back within the same day. And so it's a really seamless process, but we like to make sure that that, that it's easy and that it happens consistently. So Yeah, and that's cool. And again, while we're talking about, you know, money and, and you know, moving it around, you know, the, I'm sure when you're looking at investments, there's some principles and some fundamentals that you follow. What would be a couple of investment principles that, you know, dentists should be thinking about as they're, you know, putting their money to work? Well, I think one of the things that would probably surprise people is I think a lot of your listeners are probably familiar with the difference between an index and an an active uh, mutual fund. There's two types of mutual funds out there. One's an index and one's an active mutual fund. And an active mutual fund is where the person managing the fund buys stocks that they believe will predict well in the future. And an index is one that takes the stocks in the percentage that they just naturally exist in the world and don't try to pick the winners and losers, but just own all of them in a, per, in a proportionate uh, way that's representative of the size of the company. So Apple computer gets 2% and Microsoft gets 1.5% and, and so on. Vanguard is a company that uh, most people are familiar with as the index kind of provider, kind of one of the larger index providers in the world. And a lot of people are familiar with their philosophy. And the founder of Vanguard, a guy named John Vogel, wrote a book in the 70s about how important it was to, to, to lower the cost of your investments. And he had several chapters on how important it was to not pay anyone to, to manage your money for you, but that you should self-direct your own investing and bypass the 1% fee that you pay per year to a financial advisor to buy these funds for you, that you can do this on your own. And he, it was a pretty compelling book. I mean, when I first read it, I hadn't really even gotten into the financial services industry. And I thought, well, that's a tough argument to for someone to be a financial planner. I don't know how you can kind of combat that. You know, there's a good argument. So uh, it's interesting because last year, I mean, the same company that he founded released a research paper that they've been working on for a long time. 
and it's called Advisors Alpha. And what's happened over the years is financial advisors are actually, they're responsible for almost half or more than half of Vanguard's assets right now, meaning the money that is brought to Vanguard's coming through financial advisors in a lot of cases, because financial advisors agree with this as well, that indexing is really important. And what Vanguard's research was trying to do, they're trying to just say, what are the factors that make it? Because they have clients that come direct to them, right? People that just come direct. And then they have people who come with a financial advisor. And they were trying to measure the actual rates of return that investors with financial advisors are achieving and rates of return that investors are achieve, achieving directly. So just kind of comparing these two and saying, what's the difference and what's happening between these two segments of, of people? And th- it was really interesting because if you go to their website and read this research paper, it's pretty extensive. But, but they basically say, after paying an advisor 1% a year, that they've concluded that behavioral coaching, meaning helping people not make irrational decisions or making very tempered decisions adds approximately 2% per year in net returns, according to the studies that they've done and others have done. But theirs was pretty extensive. They compared just direct accounts versus advisor accounts and tried to just determine what the behavior was of the investors when they left the market, what they purchased, um, how often they stayed invested, how often they invested their cash versus sat on their cash. And the, anyway, this bottom line is that they, they've the the company that used to kind of argue against uh, having an assisted approach to investing is now advocating for one because they really feel like this behavioral coaching is the primary reason that the, there's a difference in returns between the self-directed investors and the investors who use an advisor. Now, I'm not advocating necessarily for a financial advisor in all cases. I really believe that there are advisors who hurt clients much more than they help. I mean, that's definitely the case. (laughs) No question. But there are some advisors who really understand what their role is and how they can help people achieve higher returns. And Vanguard basically listed like seven or eight things that financial advisors can do that add as much as 3% a year in returns to a client on average. And um, it was really interesting because it was a, a pretty industry like groundbreaking study because it's coming from the company that at one time said, don't hire an advisor. (laughs) And, and so anyway, I thought it was interesting because I don't really have a problem with people investing their own money. I like it if people are interested in it and if they have experience a little bit and, and feel like they have the temperament to do it. But the point of me bringing this up was there are these tendencies that people have. If you're self-directing the tendencies at a high level, you know, they're, There are things called loss aversion. Uh, There are behavioral tendencies, loss aversion, narrow framing, anchoring, herd mentality, being overly optimistic, uh, responding to the media, um, feeling regret unnecessarily. There's all these emotional behaviors that really make people do improper things with their money. And those are the primary reasons in my experience that you should hire a financial advisor. And if you read a lot of quotes from Warren Buffett or... Benjamin Graham or David Bach or any of these kind of main like seminal investor types. One of my favorite comes from Benjamin Graham and he said the investor's chief problem and even his worst enemy is likely to be himself. And, and, and that's a, that's a, that's a truth for a lot of us. And being a financial planner, I can, I can look at my own finances and say, it's hard for me to be entirely objective about what I should do with my own money, where my one of the advisors in my office, I've assigned him to be my advisor. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. what and he can tell me things that I just can't really tell myself as easily, if that makes sense. I don't know if you've ever experienced that y- yourself, but I'm sure you can relate to it. I, I have. You're ticking off a few of those, you know, emotional challenges, you know, regret, you know, all those sorts of things. Like, oh yes, yes, I should have bought more during the GFC. All yeah. those sorts of things, or you know, I've sat on cash too long. So I, I completely identify with some of those things, and I'm sure many of the listeners do too. I'm sure everyone's got their could have, should have, and would have, you know, as I like to call them. That we go, ah, oh, wish, wish I'd done that differently. Yeah, I mean, there's a I do a three hour presentation for CE called the nine categories of irrational investor behavior, where we go through each of these, and it's. 
it just, it's kind of overwhelming to see the mistakes that people make, not realizing it with how they feel about what they're doing with their money. And it, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's really insightful to just focus on the, the need for accountability in your own financial decisions. And whether you're getting that from a financial advisor or a friend or an accountant or another dentist that has some more experience with money, you really should run your major decisions by someone else. And, 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 and I, I just don't think people should be self-directing every financial decision they make. Yeah, I think that's a really, really wise piece of advice. So if we talk about principles, you know, trying not to be too reliant on self-direction is obviously a key principle when it comes to investing. Are there any other principles that you think are really pertinent for dentists in particular that they should be considering as they go through their investment strategy? I would say, first of all, make sure that the per, the person, most dentists hire some kind of an advisor. I mean, most people do. And I would say you should hire an advisor who is not getting paid to sell you products. That is a, and and I don't, saying that, I, I don't know what the ratios are in Australia. In the United States, in Australia, it's actually, it's more common to have a fee only, what we call a fiduciary in the United States, someone who's paid on a fee basis rather than commissions or product sales. In the United States, it's, it's a very high percentage. The vast majority, probably 80% plus are working with a commission-based broker that sells product. And and that's just a, that's a, a starting point. I would say you, you need to make sure your advice is not coming from someone who's selling you things. The, the second thing I'd probably give as a piece of advice would be, you, you need to really understand your investment DNA, what your, you know, your tolerance for returns is, uh, what your tolerance for volatility is. And, and if I say you're going to get a, let's say a, a diversified portfolio of Australian equities, okay, was going to give us a 10% annual return. What, when I say that, what I mean is there will probably never be one year in 20 years where we'll actually get 10. We're probably going to get anywhere from negative 30 to positive 50 in every given year. And we don't really know in advance what that's going to be. But we know that over a 12 and 13 year period, we'll probably see that mean or that average be close to 10. But over five years, it's probably not likely. A five year return might be more than 10 or less than 10, but it's not going to be 10. And, and I think that you just really need to understand that. Most people, when they talk to a financial advisor and he says, we should get about five or 6% or four or 5% or six or seven, they're expecting to see 6% at the end of every year. And when they don't see that, they get bothered and it makes them frustrated and they want to change their plan and they switch advisors or they change strategies or they do something new. I'm not saying you shouldn't switch advisors if your advisor is not communicating well, if he's charging too much, if they're, if they have a poor temperament, you know, for being consistent. There's a lot of reasons to switch advisors, but you, you shouldn't switch advisors only based on how you feel about your returns. That's not a good measure of whether an advisor is doing a good job. And a lot of times people will use that as the primary parameter to determine whether they're going to leave. Over time, I think that's fair. But it's more about what exactly are you investing in and were you expecting your performance to look like it looks? Is this meeting your expectations? And, it's not, and, and I feel like a lot of times people just don't understand how returns work. And so I like to build a really clear DNA that shows someone you know, your, your lowest one year return is probably going to be as low as 26%. Like that's probably the worst scenario. And the best scenario is we probably will make 47 and the worst three year return would have been negative 5% a year for three years in a row. And the best three year return is probably going to be 20% a year for three years in a row. And, and so that's your range and expect that. And, and most people are like, man, that's a horrible, I just don't want to live that way with that much uncertainty. <laughs> like I just want to make something consistent. A lot of people don't want that kind of variability, but that's what it takes to get a higher return. You have to live with that variability and, and a lower return, like three or 4%, you can have that without any, any variability at all. And so I, I think knowing your investment DNA is really, really important. 
probably like a couple more I could throw out there. But if you do, you have any questions about that? I just want to make sure I was clear to listeners. Look, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, you know, yeah. Know thyself obviously is critical in in business as much as it is in anything. One of the things I just wanted to touch on though is coming back to that you know long term average, the ten year average of ten percent for the Australian equities market, just as an example. What I'm hearing you say in that is being clear about your investment timeframes as well. Because if you're thinking, you know, I've got three or four years before I need this money back, I'm expecting a 10% year on year return, then you've got to also look at the time frame that you're willing to put your money away. Is that correct? Yeah, no question. I mean, and it's, it's, definitely, it's definitely a huge factor. If I pulled up the Australian index, it would be interesting to be able to walk, that, walk through that with people. But there's an, you know, there's an actual expectation that you should have for each calendar year. And, and there's an actual expectation for what you should have over a three year and five year period based on there's, there's, you know, dozens and dozens of years worth of uh, stock market history in Australia, you know, and that, and to be able to base that on. And another principle I'd probably just add to that is I really think there's a real science to investing. And I would recommend that people follow the actual science that's been developed around investments. There are really standardized investment principles and how to build portfolios that they're not really debatable as much as they used to be. Um, Science has really come a long way in investing. And I think there are some objective truths that are just easy to, you, you can look at Nobel Prize research that has been done from people like Harry Markowitz and William Sharp, Eugene Fama, Kenneth French, Gary Brinson, Roger Ibbotson, Richard Toller, Daniel Kahneman. All of these people have won really consequential Nobel Prizes in economics around behavioral economics and around you know equities and return factors. And if your financial advisor is not even aware of the science behind investing, the academic evidence that's there about how to construct a portfolio. It's not portfolio theory, right? Yeah, there's a lot to it. And most advisors are still trying to position themselves as the smart person in the room. Like you just need to trust me because I know what I'm doing. And I just think that's not the right approach. There's a science, a body of work that is widely accepted. And what you should, your, your advisor should be doing is just let you know letting you into the world of how it works and then allowing you to choose to hire him to do it because you're too busy or you won't get to it or you don't have enough time or you don't trust yourself to implement it properly but they shouldn't shield you from kind of a, a black curtain of of them being the smart guy and that happens quite often so it's a bit like the wizard of oz really isn't it because exactly. you know they don't want to pull back the curtain because you never know what might be behind there maybe just a small little man yeah, with not much clue either. But interesting you talk about modern portfolio theory because some years ago when I was doing some study, I had to construct a portfolio based on certain parameters. And it's really interesting because you are the first financial advisor I've ever spoken to. And I have spoken to quite a few <laughs> who has actually come out and spoken about the mathematics behind portfolio construction. So that's a refreshing thought. And as dentists, we love science. And so the fact yeah. that there is science behind that, I know that there's going to be a certain number of listeners going, great, let me let me add that. So if there was a particular resource that you would point people to in terms of just you know, getting a bit more information and knowledge in that particular area around portfolio construction, what would be, you know, something that, you know, distilled wisdom that you'd point people to? Well, outside of my podcast, which we go into this in a lot of detail, I would say my podcast is a fun one, the Dennis Money Show on iTunes. If you just listen to the investment episodes, we go into it a lot there. In terms of a web, in terms of a web resource, there there are two or three kind of really dominant investment research firms that focus on this vanguard being one of them if you if you go to their website there's a lot of portfolio construction information Um, there's another company called dimensional fund advisors they have a pretty good penetration in the australian market as well dfa if you look at dfaus.com there's an investor site dimension it's called dimensional fund advisors their headquarters their trading headquarters is in austin texas but they have offices all around the world and They focus heavily on index research, on index construction. They have a pretty friendly investor website. If you go to Kenneth French's website, K-E-N-N-E-T-H, French, Kenneth French is one of the 
like premier researchers on um, the field of investment academics. And he teaches uh, finance at Dartmouth University in New England. And and he has a his own website is a very deep resource of index returns, index data, evidence of how to construct a portfolio. And basically what it boils down to is there's kind of three main like principles that really guide what returns people get. There's basically three things. One of them is, is your portfolio expensive or not? (laughs) Basically, is it a really expensive portfolio? Meaning, do you pay a high percentage towards of your of your assets towards a smart person to pick individual stocks for you? Or are you buying indices? Let's assume for the sake of our conversation today that everyone listening is buying indices, less expensive investments, which I know is not the case, but let's assume that's the case. And let's talk about the second issue. The second issue is now that you know that you should have a low cost strategy, what percentage of your portfolio is allocated to each country? Okay. (laughs) Because that is going to be the largest determiner of your long-term returns. For example, the global stock market is approximately, it's probably like 40 something trillion dollars as of right now. So the, the term, the cumulative value of the global stock market is 40 something trillion dollars. About half of that value is from companies that are domiciled in the United States of America. Okay. 7% of that comes from the United Kingdom. Uh, 4% comes from Canada. from Japan, 3% from France, 3% from Germany, probably 3% from Switzerland, 1% from Sweden. China only has 3% and Australia has 2% of the world's uh, equity market. What will happen typically is based on where people live, their country of domicile, that usually dictates how their portfolio is allocated. And if you believe in economics and, and free flow of capital, what you believe is that if it's the if the best place to do business is Australia, that more companies will go there. If it's not the best place to do business, then more people will go to Japan or more countries will go to Germany. So a, a market kind of academic way of looking at how you would diversify your stock portfolio would be allow your money to be diversified based on what the world map looks like for stocks. You know, if the United States is... 40 something to 50% of the global market, you should at least consider that being your allocation. Now, most people won't do that. They will allow the country of domicile. Like in the United States, I meet people all the time who only have US equities. And the downside of that is there will be multiple periods of time, sometimes 10 year periods, where your country of domicile will not have a positive return. A 10 year period with a flat return. And you've probably seen that in Australian uh, history. It's common in the United States from the year 2000 to the year 2010. It was actually a 0% annual return for a decade. It was point like one, two. And so, but if you had a globally diversified portfolio during that period of time with capital in every market in each index, your in your investment returns would have been much higher. It would have been pushing seven to eight percent over that ten year period of time. Even though there was a global crisis during that period, the diversification you would have gotten from Brazil and China and India and France and Germany would have given your and Australia during that period would have given you a higher performing portfolio than if you would have been only in one country of domicile. So when people, I meet clients all the time that get on the phone and they say, I already have a low cost index portfolio. So why do I need you? (laughs) And so my answer is it's really important to make sure that you are investing the right percentage of your money in the right countries. If you're an indexed investor, if you don't care, then just it's a crapshoot and you can pick stocks and hope and all the best. You know, if you're a science person, like most dentists, they want predictability out of their portfolio. And so it's really important that you have the right allocation. And the third thing is every month when you make deposits now, where are you putting the money? Okay. Are you putting in the exact percentages that you picked when you started or should it change as the world changes? For example, let's say the United States is initially, you, you say the United States is 50% of my portfolio. 
let's say you have a small portfolio. It's Europe. You're going to do Europe and Asia in one ETF or one mutual fund, one investment. You're going to do the United States in one. And you're going to do emerging countries in one. If during, let's say it was a third, a third, a third. Let's just say it's that simple. If during the next calendar quarter, Europe is down 6% and you're going to put a thousand bucks into your account and the United States is up 2%, do you want to put a third, a third, a third into each? Because if you do, you're just going to be buying the United States more than you need to because it's gone up. I mean, right now, the only thing that's down is Europe. Your Europe holding went down 5% and your $1,000 should allocate entirely to that European position because it's down the most right then. And if you're a long-term investor, you don't just want to keep putting money in the same percentages every time you put money in your accounts or you're never going to be buying at a discount. You'll, you won't be buying cheap. You'll always be buying the same no matter how the market moves. And so a good financial advisor can effectively take your money and when he sees the deposit, he runs a test that says which one of these mutual funds is down the most and that's the one that I'm going to allocate money to. And if nothing's down at all and they're all the same, then we'll do it the same. But usually that's not the case with every trade. And so over a lifetime, that does make a big difference in returns, in how returns shake out for people over time. Which countries do you initially allocate your capital to? And then how do you allocate the money every every month? So anyway, those are kind of a few principles that I just think are important. And if someone wants to learn more about it, I've got a whole couple podcasts on it. But. Yeah, I think that's fascinating, actually, mate, because, you know, oftentimes index funds are viewed as a passive investment, you know, because you buy the, what's the old saying, instead of buying the needle in the haystack, you buy the whole haystack. And yes, what I'm hearing you say is you can still be thoughtful and active about how you allocate your money according to you know country of domicile and other other considerations. And so there is still some consideration and thought that needs to go into that strategy as opposed to just a straight dollar cost averaging into the same fund without thinking about it time and again. So I think that's really wise investment advice there. Hey, Reese, we, we will wrap up in a second because I know I've taken up a lot of your time today and I'm really very grateful for the insights you've shared. But I do want to just quiz you one last time before we let you off the hook, if that's cool. And the question I've got for you is this. Throughout the last, oh, I don't know, 10 or so years, we've obviously seen some economic turmoil. We've seen some changes, whether it's economic, financial, even geopolitical sorts of changes. One of my observations is that where there's upheaval there's also opportunity so if you were to identify just a couple of things to consider for dentists listening about where some of the opportunities might lie what would be your thoughts there mate well i I think you've answered that question in a broad way and i'll give you i i think i could answer that in terms of opportunities in the investment world or opportunities as an entrepreneur and um i think i'll touch both of those just really briefly i think when it comes to upheaval in the financial world and there's a lot of global conflict, you'll you'll generally just have a heightened sense of fear and anxiety about economics in general, about finance in general. And we will experience uh, more economic turmoil moving forward, especially as we continue to have, you know, threats of terrorism globally, as we have countries that are struggling to get out from underneath mountains of debt that they've built up over the last, you know, 25 to 30 years. There's going to be continued volatility and that's going to push a lot of people out of being entrepreneurial and being independent uh, business owners because it, it, it fear generally and it engenders lack of competition. It forces people to pull back and be less aggressive about how they approach their business and how they spend money and how they compete. And, and I, I really feel like for most people, no matter what, you've got a 40 to 50 hour week that you're going to work. For some of us, hopefully it's less. You know, as time passes, luckily I've been able to work less than I used to when I started. But there, either way, you're going to have to go to work and either way, you're going to work the same amount of time. And so I, I like to look at when there's periods of uncertainty and scarcity and when people are fearful, I really like to look at at life in, in that lens of, Either way, I got to wake up in the morning and I've got to go to work and I've got to spend my time uh, executing a full day. So I might as well spend my time doing the highest optimal use of what I can do uh, with that eight hours or with that 10 hours or seven hours or whatever you choose to work. And what I mean by that is there, there are tasks that you can complete that already have answers 
and things you can do that already have answers and you can just show up and get those things done. Or you can spend your time fixing problems that don't have answers yet. <laughs> and and I really feel like the people who spend their time fixing problems that don't have answers end up with larger businesses and more successful careers. And people who settle back into the status quo and just do the job that's obvious right in front of them, they won't experience as much growth and progress. And I feel like as, as far as, I'll, maybe I'll let you respond to that because I'm sure that, that strikes a chord with you at some degree. Uh, absolutely. I think that's the essence of business is to solve problems. And you're quite right. I think the, I think the gold lies in identifying the solution that is not yet available but not only that is keeping it as simple as possible as well there's a lot of people who overcomplicate stuff and i'm not saying simplifying things for the sake of dumbing things down but equally finding that neat and elegant solution is quite hard sometimes oh yeah i think there's real elegance and simplicity and i think that it's also harder to do than complicated stuff there's a great quote and Again, I'm going to probably butcher this quote, but there's a lovely quote that says, I would have uh, written you a shorter letter, but I didn't have time. And <laughs> and I, th- I think that sums up my philosophy as well, is trying to keep things, pair things back to the effective dose, the minimal effective dose. I totally agree. I totally agree. And I, I feel like um, one of the quotes that we have here in our office that's up on our wall is from... Uh, Shakespeare, which is, or sorry, Leonardo da Vinci, this is a da Vinci quote where simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. I'm sure you've heard that before. And I really feel like most people, we, I released a podcast episode last week called things a dentist can learn from a fifth grader. And I went and taught at an elementary school about economics in a fifth grade class. And it was just so impressive to me to see that the lessons I was teaching about specialization in an economy and how being specialized was really important. We talked about maybe how to not just mow lawns for everyone, but learn how to mow a lawn for a school and then only mow lawns for schools and that that would be better than a generic lawnmower. (laughs) And so dentists are really the most specialized occupation almost on the globe. I mean, in terms of specialization, I'm not saying just career technical specialization. That is a huge part of it. I mean, being a dentist is a huge technical specialization, but most dentists also have to run their own business, which is very different from other medical professionals, which requires an additional level of specialization. And what I find is that too many dentists overcomplicate their lives by keeping too many things on their own plate and trying to become expert in too many areas. And I think that inherently the opportunity for you is to, to build wealth is when you can surround yourself with a capable accountant, a capable attorney, a capable coach, a capable consultant, a capable practice manager in your office that's, that you're employing, a capable financial advisor. If you, can, if you can specialize just in hiring the best people, if you can focus on not letting any of your people off the hook, but you know, being slow to hire them and quick to fire them if, if they are letting you down consistently. Build yourself that, the right team and don't try to be cheap about it. Don't try to say, well, I think I could do that on my own and maybe I can try that. I mean, for the most part, I just, I really struggle seeing dentists not hire consultants and not hiring coaches and not hiring advisors and CPAs and attorneys and just trying to sort of solve the problems on their own. I, I'm not a huge fan of that. And if you've listened to my podcast, I, I'm capable of doing a lot of things on my own, but I, I do hire a lot of things and I try to pay them fairly and make sure I value them and treat them well. And, you know, build your team in a way that gives them confidence that you trust them and, and it will allow you to achieve so much more and it'll simplify your life so much and use those people as, as resources to teach you and coach you and train you. And don't, and and try to just resist the temptation to just cuddle up and do everything on your own because it really will slow down the growth of your, your career. And it will definitely slow down the growth of your net worth. We, we, we see that consistently in, in our practice, we track by age, the exact net worth of every client and their exact savings rates and all the statistics. And we know that people who have a tendency to keep more on their plate tend to grow slower than people who can outsource and and build an effective team. So I I think that that's the way I view simplification and 
my career as a financial advisor is anything but simple. I mean, we've only touched the tip of the iceberg in terms of how to properly advise someone and manage money effectively to maximize returns. But I, you know, the dentist doesn't have to know everything I know and they don't have to know everything you know, Jesse, but they do have to at some point say, I'm going to focus on building out my local network in the community. I'm going to focus on hand speed. I'm going to focus on clinical competency. I'm going to focus on becoming some level of a marketing expert. I'm going to pick one or two areas that I can really dive deep in that will make the biggest difference in my practice. And I'm going to surround myself with capable people because if you don't do that, it's just a slower career and it is more frustrating and it takes a lot longer to get to the point where you've built real wealth. And so I'll leave that kind of final thought there with you and you can let you respond. I, I couldn't agree more. I think, again, surrounding yourself with smart people is critical. I was fortunate enough to spend some time with some very clever business people overseas recently. And uh, one of the resounding comments that came from that was, yeah, try to hire people better than yourself. And I'm a big believer in, in that. I'm There are many elements of my life where I am very happily not the smartest person in the room and I'm very happy to give that mantle to many other people so I think that holds us in good stead. Reese, I just wanted to say thanks so much for taking the time out of your day to come and hang with the audience here at Savvy Dentist. Really very grateful. You've shared so many you know, pearls of wisdom and you know lots of things that people can you know, take away and implement on a practical level. So I'm assuming if people want to find out more about what you do, they head across to dentistadvisors.com or go and listen to your podcast, right? The Money Show. Yeah, The Dentist Money Show on iTunes or just hit dentistadvisors.com. If you want to just send me an email, I can send you a lot of, you know, pertinent info that might be specific to your situation. I have a lot of guidebooks and resources and research papers that we've done. So you can just hit me up at Reese at dentistadvisors.com. It's R-E-E-S-E at dentistadvisors.com. And I'd be happy to send anything out that uh, people are interested in learning about. Thanks. That is so generous of you, mate. I really appreciate it. And once again, from all of us here at Savvy Dentist, I appreciate you taking the time out of your day to come and hang with us. You've been a gem. Thanks, mate. And by the way, I love your Aussie accent. Thanks, Jesse. Oh, yeah. I appreciate it, man. We really appreciate all your support. Thanks a lot. Hey, can we just finish up with a g'day, mate? G'day, mate. <laughs> Perfect. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Reed. Have a good one. Thank you for listening to the Savvy Dentist podcast. For more episodes, go to drjessegreen.com slash Savvy Dentist. And to discover how to build a high-performance dental practice, visit drjessegreen.com and download the free report.